still early. Uh, thanks everyone for being here this evening. I really appreciate it. And I realize that Pat said that this event was planned a year ahead of time, which explains a lot because I was only given this event in December. Um, I think because no one wanted May. May is a very tough month to have an event. Students are not on campus, faculty are taking vacations, and that really leads me to a, a heartfelt thanks to Dr. Dr. Gibson and to Alex Godwin for stepping up and saying, we'd love to do this event. Uh, we're thrilled to be there and spending quite a bit of time uh, focusing their efforts when they could be on vacation like everyone else in academia. We don't get vacation at Georgia Tech. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there you go. If anyone needs anybody to do anything, Greg does not take vacation. Uh, so, but I am absolutely thrilled to have them here and to tell you a little bit about um, Dr. Gibson, other than the fact that he is just a phenomenal human being. Um, he is a professor in the School of Biology at Georgia Tech, and he has been the director of the Center of uh, Biology there since 2009. He received his PhD in developmental gen genetics in Switzerland and did a postdoc at Stanford in um, genomics revolution let's see, in the early 1990s, just as genomics revolution was commencing. So he was uh, certainly an early adopter, groundbreaker, pioneer in that industry. He was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science for his contribution to the understanding of the evolution and development of complex traits. We all know what complex traits are, right? <laughs> yeah. If you're married, you know. Uh, and if you have children, you live it daily. Uh, and development of methodologies for analyzing gene expression. He is the author of several books. One of them is It Takes a Genome. I love that. Uh, so he's also creative and has a wonderful sense of humor. And his uh, group now studies the genetics of adult onset human disease, as well as primate models of malaria, and is increasingly interested in personalized genomic medicine, which is really what brought him here this evening. And he is working with Greg and the Center for Integrative Genomics to design new visualization techniques, again, working with our own Dr. John Stasco uh, for personalized genomics and healthcare. So thank you both very much for being here this evening and for leading this panel. Okay. This is Max. And this is Hannah. They both suffer from an autoimmune disorder. Max is a patient today, and his story is based on current medical practice. Hannah's story is our prediction of what will happen in the future when medicine has become personalized for this condition. Max's doctor correctly identifies his condition and prescribes the standard first-line therapy, corticosteroids. Max tolerates them poorly and experiences nausea and vomiting. Max goes back to the doctor, who decides to revise his dose. However, Max still suffers adverse events. Max goes back to his doctor, who switches him to non-steroidal drugs. The nausea and vomiting subside, but the drugs have limited efficacy. He remains prone to hyperimmune reactions. Hannah visits her doctor and is also diagnosed correctly. She undergoes genetic and serum protein tests. These establish the genetic cause of her problem and help identify effective and well-tolerated treatments. Diseases with the same symptoms often have different genetic causes. Genetic tests allow doctors to identify the roots of the problem and tailor treatments to each patient. Further analysis of genetic markers can aid selection of a treatment with minimal side effects. Hannah's doctor prescribes a genetically tailored drug for her condition. The new medical technology allows the doctor to treat the patient, not just the disease. Max suffers a hypersensitivity reaction and is hospitalized. His doctor prescribes Imuran after struggling to find a milder therapy which Max can tolerate. This leaves Max prone to cancers. Hannah's treatment is successful and well tolerated. Her condition is managed effectively. So I guess the question that, that I'd like to address today is, is, so that's the vision of the future of medicine. So is it real? Is how far away, and if it is, how far away from it are we? And the quick answer to that is that it, it, currently it's not real. And we're maybe 10 years away, we're maybe 50 years away. I can't tell you. 
for some conditions, we're actually close. And I'll give you a couple of stories like that. For most of us in this room, we're not close. But what I'd like to suggest is some more realistic ways in which the genome uh, might be of interest and, and use to us. And we're going to, you know, the, there's been a revolution in genomics in the last 20 years, but in human genomics in the last five years. So everything I tell you today is just the start, and where we are five years from now is going to be totally different. Okay? So it's an incredibly exciting time to be in this field, as, as those of you who are practicing genetics know. Um, I think the next great intellectual frontier for us in academia is to work out how to translate this knowledge into patient care. Okay? It's not a statistic. We, we've conquered the statistics. We, we know how to study 500,000 people and manipulate the data. What we don't know how to do is to translate it back into this sort of situation, and that's the sort of thing that I'd like to talk with you about today. Okay? So I'm going to start with this slide, which is sort of an image of the way I think probably most of us think of genetics that all complex traits, so that is just about everything except for eye color and hair color, so obesity, the desire to go shopping, which I've put on the X chromosome there naughtily, <laughs> the proclivity to do air guitar, which I've put on the Y chromosome. Blue eyes is, is essentially a Mendelian trait, although it's not really. Um, my grandchildren have a completely Italian mother with dark brown hair and dark blue brown eyes and they have blue eyes and blonde hair, as does Angelina here, who's also an Italian family. So whatever we are told about blue eyes being Mendelian, not really true. It's about 80% accurate. Coffee drinking. If you read Craig Venter, how many of you heard of Craig Venter? OK, well, that's amazing, just two people. So he is one of the real pioneers of this field. He was the person who sequenced his own genome in competition with the, with the government or the international effort. Um, he's the person who's created a bug right from scratch by, by stitching together um, synthesized nucleotides. He's the person who sequenced the oceans of the world and discovered more genes than anybody else. He wrote a book called A Life Decoded, a biography of himself when he was about 35 or 40, uh, describing all of that, a fascinating read. And every chapter had a box about his own genome and what it means. And so one of those chapters says that his genetics tells him he's a hot coffee drinker which he is. Um, he also is a night owl, likes to work late into the night. But if you read the details of the boxes in each chapter, you realize that, in fact, almost all of them say, well, actually, my genetics doesn't agree, doesn't agree with who I am. What's that about? There must be another gene somewhere. But of course, it's nowhere near that simple. Genetics is way, way more complex, and that's been the message that we've learned in the last few years. In fact, for most traits, whether it's height, body weight, uh, aspects of mood, or if it's disease liability, there are thousands of genes that influence that trait. And every one of those genes just makes a very, very small contribution. Okay. And so the challenge we have in, in genomics, uh, in predictive health at any rate, is to, is to work out how to use that. So there are some companies starting to spring up. Here are just uh, four uh, that I've put up. So Navigenics and 23andMe uh, were two of the pioneers. 23andMe, how many of you have heard of 23andMe? Just about everyone. How many of people have you got 23andMe? Just one? Just me? That's amazing. Well, you're too late if you haven't got it already, because they were shut down by the FDA uh, for all intents and purposes in, in November, in late November, because of concerns that the data people were getting was, was going to cause them to make health decisions without good advice. Well, you can debate why it was done. Personally, I think it's a pity because I think it set back the venture of personalized medicine and genomics five or ten years. I think they were doing a fantastic job of educating the 100,000 or the 200,000 people who were members. However, it is very clear that what they were doing is what we call recreational genomics. It was fun. It wasn't really that informative to a person's health. Navigenics was the same, but in fact, they've now shut down as well voluntarily. I think they were bought out by, by, by someone else. I can't even remember who. Uh, they're no longer providing personal genome services. Personalis is a company um, founded by uh, Artul Bute and others at Stanford University to bring personal genome sequencing into the realm of re regular care. 
And uh, Sanford Imaginetics is another one of these. So he's a, a, one of these billionaire investors who's in fact decided to put, I think, something like $100 million into incorporating genomic medicine into regular medical practice. So the idea is that you and I will go to our doctors. This is in fact in North Dakota and Minnesota. And you would have your genome sequenced. And they will think about how to incorporate that into your care. So it's starting to happen. And I think it's not unrealistic that five years from now that this will be a part of the care for, for all of those who can afford it. And what do I mean by afford? Well, the cost of sequencing your entire genome has now gone down to $1,000 as of a few months ago. So there is a company uh, called Illumina that allows you to do that. Um, much of what you get from that can be done for, for the $100 that 23andMe charges, but certainly not all. They're, they're, and I can I ask, answer questions about what the difference is. Okay, so in the, term, in the grand scheme of things, you know, $1,000 is certainly a lot to an undergraduate, but $1,000 is not a lot to a person who's facing, you know, total lifetime costs, medical costs in, in the uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So what can your genome do for you? Well, one thing is ancestry, and in fact, 23andMe is still providing ancestry information as, as Ancestry.com and others. So basically, by reading your genome, it is possible to infer what your ancestry is. Mine is incredibly boring. I am from northern England, 99.9%. .9%. There is not one person in my family who's done anything interesting. In fact, I, I like to go around and sort of say, in fact, the most interesting about, thing about me is that I'm about 5% Neanderthal. <laughs> I came into the country at 6 o'clock in the morning a, a few months ago, and the, and the, 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 uh, the immigration officer said, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a scientist. He said, what sort of scientist? So I'm a geneticist. This has happened. He said, well, well, tell us something interesting about genetics. And of course, I'm blurry-eyed. And I, so I looked at him. I said, well, you're probably about 5% Neanderthal. And I thought, oh, that probably wasn't a really smart thing to say. <laughs> but he, he let me through anyway. In fact, I've found that immigration officers actually do have good senses of humor. Um, so um, you know, we can read that for, for, for you know, I'm also, I go back to the first fleet of people who came to Australia, so I'm genetically, you know, obviously, real genetics, I'm a criminal ancestry, so I'm really kind of a bad person. So I've got Neanderthal stuff there, and I've got the criminal ancestry going on. But it's not in my, I don't see it in my DNA. Um, oh, I'm, I'm at high risk of heroin addiction as well, according to 23andMe. Okay, but, but I don't know where to get heroin, so I'm not at any risk. So I'm, I'm pretty, kind of square, I'm kind of square. It's genotype by environment interaction, I like to teach that. Um, so, but you can tell, you know, how much is African, how much is Asian ancestry, and it's getting better and better and better, and in fact, there are even, it's now possible to tell a person from Holland whether they come from the north of Holland or the south of Holland. They probably already know that, but, you know, most of us uh, in America, most young people in America are a real mixture, and so it's really fascinating for people to be able to get that information. And you can even line up the chromosomes, and you can compare them to your twin brother or sister and say, oh, I got that bit from dad, and you got that bit from mom, and that's why you're doing what you're doing, which is not true, but it's fun. Second thing is what, the, what was implied by that little video that, that one of my students found for me this semester. And that is that genomics will help you manage your disease conditions. Okay? So specifically, if you have an inflammatory bowel disease, I think in the next five years, we will work out in many cases what the actual genetic cause. Now, they use the word cause in that video. Um, that's a pretty strong word. It's not always, I mean, cause, most disease is a combination of genetics and the environment. But you can at least find out what the underlying mechanism is. And so you will find out that people who've got the same disease, perhaps Crohn disease, some people it's because they've got hyperactive STAT4 activity, and other people it's because they've got unusual interleukin-6 activity or something like that. And it'll be complex, but we will be able to do that. And if you know what the cause of rheumatoid arthritis is, or you know what the cause of your particular brand of depression is, then presumably we'll be able to tailor drugs towards that, just as people are now starting to tailor drugs to different uh, cancers. Which brings me to my next point, is cancer. So this is where personalized medicine today is absolutely making a difference and is being incorporated into standardized medical care right now. You have, it used to be the model that you, ha you had breast cancer or you had colon cancer or you had lung cancer and this is the drug that we'll prescribe for that. The future is that you will have that genome sequence, the cancer genome sequence, and you will see that you have um, a BRAF V600 mutation and that is responsive 
to this particular drug, and that's the drug we'll give you, irrespective of the source of that tumor. Okay? So your medication will be tailored to the genetic changes that have happened in your cancer, at least in the most refractory cases. I don't know that that will ever be first-line quality of care, but it's coming, it's happening, it's incredibly exciting, it's saving lives, and it's two years old, but it will be uh, more and more uh, patients uh, very, very quickly. Wellness is what interests me, okay? So, so Ken Brigham, many of you may know, so he founded the Center for Health Discovery and Wellbeing between Emory and Georgia Tech, which I took advantage of when I moved here about five years ago. So it was a, a cohort of about 700 Emory employees who came in and had a, a health partner. So they had a deep clinical checkup with about, you know, so with complete bone density and um, heart function and, and all sorts of measures. And you sat down with a health partner who helped you formulate a plan for your medical care for the next 12 months. And um, so I've done genomics on that cohort, and I won't show you the data, I won't talk about that, but I'm really interested in this question as, does incorporating genomics into that care help people? So I can tell you that I've just, I'm about to submit a paper looking at what's happened over the first two years of that study, and it turns out that the people who have at the highest risk of chronic diseases, particularly of cardiovascular disease, have responded the most. In fact, they're profiles come back closer to normal quite consistently, okay? So that's the good news. For most of us, it doesn't really have that big of an effect to participate in a program like that. But the real question is, can your genetic data help you tailor things that are really specific and interesting to you as a person? Every one of us in this room has something medically that we have that's not unique to ourselves, but is certainly something that we are more concerned about than others. Okay? And so the question is, can our genomics uh, help with that? And when I say genomics, I don't just mean the sequence of your genome, which is pretty much what you see, but I also mean complex readouts of how your genes are being expressed. Now, I don't know how much that terminology means to you, but basically your genes are instructions, and between the instructions and what you are, are molecules, are transcripts and proteins. Okay? So actually we now have in genomics ways of measuring those transcripts and proteins. They're closer to the phenotype. And I think that will be the next wave in a 20 or 30 year cycle as to what we use to infer disease risk and wellness. Okay? So the question is, can our genetics help us live long and prosper? I certainly hope so. Uh, but it's not just a biological question, it's also a sociological question. And then the final thing here, which is really not a final thing, because this is the other realm of personalized medicine that is here today, is prediction. By which I mean predicting whether or not your child will be born with a birth defect. Already, colleagues of mine who are in their 30s and are getting pregnant are having tests done from their maternal blood, which is non-invasive, where they can tell whether or not their child is likely to have a chromosome, a trisomy, so a Down syndrome type event from a blood test which then goes and has some sequencing done and they can tell whether or not there's too much DNA from that extra chromosome. Because about 20% of this free circulating DNA that you find in a mother's blood is actually derived from the fetus. So this is revolutionary technology. It's about two years old. Um, a company named Sequinome initiated it. Well, they think they did. They actually just lost the court case. Uh, <laughs> that said they don't have the patent on it. So there is Natera and one other company out, they're all out in, in California, who are offering these technologies now, initially just for evaluating risk of trisomies, so, so diseases like Down syndrome. But I think it's coming that in a not too far distant future, if you have both parents who've had their genomes sequenced, and they both know that they're carriers for a mutation in a gene, for example, that causes cystic fibrosis, you will be able to sequence the mother's blood in the first trimester and work out whether that child has inherited both defective alleles, and then the parents will have uh, more options to make decisions. That's coming. And then, of course, the other angle of this is um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, where you can actually take uh, in vitro fertilized embryos at the 8 or 12 cell stage or 16 cell stage, you can take one cell out and you can actually look at its genetics and choose which of those embryos is the one that you'd rather implant. Okay? And that becomes a somewhat scary realm. Uh, there are bioethicists who feel that given that opportunity, 
something like 50% of parents will avail themselves of it and make decisions that I want my child to be the next Michael Jordan. Okay? Stay tuned. So there are sort of five ways in which our genomes can help us, and that's why there's so much hype around this. Okay? And it is hype. Right now, it, as I, I use the term recreational genomics. There's, there's, in the domain of wellness, there's not a lot that can be done for most of us. But, but we're, we're, we're making great strides. So here's a case, an uplifting story, one of the first ones. So this is actually the, the children of, of one of the CEOs of one of the founding, I think it's Life Technologies, uh, genomics companies. So his children were born. This is in Texas. Um, they were associated with Baylor College of Medicine. And the Berry twins were born and diagnosed at the age of five with a condition known as dopa-responsive dystonia. So uh, they basically weren't creating enough dopamine, and that led to sort of a, a neuro neuropathy that was setting in, so problems with breathing and various other things. Well, so they were treated with dopamine therapy, so that's part of the good news. It's, you know, it's like you know, children all, there are 50 or so genetic tests done from a heel prick of all babies that are born. Um, so it's sort of one of those types of conditions, that just a metabolic disorder that you can correct by supplementation with, with, um, with metabolites. But as they became teenagers, their condition worsened. So worsening respiratory effects, neuromuscular defects, and they were no longer responsive to that dopamine therapy, and the prognosis was really bleak for, for both of them. And the extraordinary thing is that they're actually, well, it's a guy and a girl, so they were, uh, they're twins, so they're obviously fraternal twins. So non-identical twins. But they actually both turned out that they'd inherited the same genes from both parents. So the chances of that are actually pretty remote. But what it turned out is that they both were uh, homozygous for mutations in something called the cpaptrin reductase gene. So both parents had this mutation. They were heterozygous, so they were carriers. And then both children had a 1 in 4 chance, so 1 in 4 by 1 in 4, 1 in 16 chance that both children would end up with that. And that's what had happened. And what this genome sequencing told them then was this particular enzyme is involved not just in the production of dopamine, but also serotonin, the other major neurotransmitter. So they supplemented the diet with serotonin, and apparently these kids are now state tennis champions, or something like that. So it's a really uplifting story of how sequencing the genome can diagnose a condition such as that and lead to interventions that make a difference. And I think that we are pretty close. In fact, I've got good friends at Duke University who are pioneering this. It's happening a lot in Holland, uh, of all places. It's happening in some other hospitals, Philadelphia, for example, where all children born with a severe abnormality, so that 1% or so of children that are born with something like this will have their genome sequenced, their failure to thrive, anything like that. And in about 30% of the cases, we can tell straight away what the likely causal mutation is. And most of these are what are called de novo mutations. In other words, they're genetic events which have happened during the generation of that baby. They weren't in the parent's DNA. They're new mutations. Okay? So there's not something, nothing you can do about that. Okay? There's just always going to be this background rate. So we can't eradicate those sorts of diseases. Now, of those 30%, maybe 5% are like this, where there's something very obvious that you can do something about it. But my friends who are doing it tell me that in 90% of those cases, the parents are just thrilled to know what the cause is. OK? And they can use that in some cases for family planning, but generally it's peace of mind. And, and you know, the cost of it is a few thousand dollars. So that's happening. Now you step up, though, to the next step, which would be something like ADHD or autism or, adult, or, or uh, adolescent onset psychiatric disorders. Now, they're more complex. We're starting to get the genetics of those, but it's not as simple as a case like this. It's not one gene. Well, there are some cases, maybe 10% of the cases, it will be this simple. But most of them, it won't be. Okay? And it's going to take us a long time to be sure. But, but we're certainly making strides. Any questions <laughs> as, we're, as we're going so far? Is this um, something you're familiar with or surprising? Yes, please. Are you familiar with any cancer centers that are doing genomic studies? Is it Duke? I know there's a the Swedish clinic up in Washington is doing that. Yeah, they're all over the country now, okay? And I guess they're ahead of the pharmacogenomics because, so there's some nice studies out there sort of saying we can predict what mutations there are, but in many cases, 
um, the drug application will be off-label. So one of the issues we have right now is that the drug's not approved for that cancer type, even though the bioinformaticians know that it's likely to respond. So all of those sort of issues have to, have to be resolved. But that will happen very quickly. You know, the, the whole paradigm is shifting as to how that's done.